Before we start, Sonia, do you want to... Well, we had a good introduction from Anil. I would like Sonia to introduce a little bit about her work and what field she is working <laughs> and just to sure. start off. Great. Well, you, you kind of gave some key words away, so I'll stay away from that. But uh, I'm the f co-founder of Youthful Cities, which was a global social venture to rank cities from a youth perspective. So we worked in 75 different cities around the world with thousands of youth uh, to rank using empirical measures. So we tried to look for ways to compare cities like Paris, with similarities, let's say, to the, Kong, to the um, Kinshasa in the DRC. So it was very, very um, involved and complex. So I'm trying to bring some of those lessons that we learned working with young people around the world and a few other projects to the conversation. Okay. Um, as the topic of the panel is leave no one behind, putting the marginalized communities at the heart of urban innovation, I think it's important to understand what we mean with the word innovation because what we always hear and perceive, it's quite a rigid process. After the project has been gone through that process, we call it as an innovation, a breakthrough. Let's just understand from our speakers what, how do they perceive the word innovation and yeah, what, are we somewhere on a wrong path or is it just a buzzword? <laughs> Mic is on? Yes, oh. it's okay. <laughs> so, for example, you have material, method, and application. One of the three at least should be new. That is an innovation. So, let's take the case, very simple case. Aspirin was designed, manufactured for headache. Old material, old method of making it. But when it was used for blood thinner, as a blood thinner for blood pressure people, it was innovation. New application was found. So either a new method, or a new application, or a new material. So far as the product is concerned, these are the three dimensions. For supply chain, accessibility, affordability, adaptability, and availability. If you make innovations in any of those four aspects, then it is an innovative process, innovative delivery, innovative system. Sonia? That's amazing, Anil. <laughs> For me, innovation is about looking at existing things and reconfiguring them in new ways, to be really short. Okay. So it, the innovation can happen anywhere. And anywhere. And anyone. Okay. Um, in your work, Sonia, with Wonder Lab, you're involving a lot with uh, the, the youth when it comes to youth projects, farmer when you're working on a certain project. So you're involving a lot users but what's happening today is we keep talking about user centered user focused design user focus focus project but it's quite top down in a way you involve users in in a 2 hours or 3 hours workshop and then you just tell them okay here is what we we researched about you and you can go ahead and use the service and it's often the case especially in developing countries where you see identify a social problem and the projects just work around doing some research and give off a service. But what exactly is user-centered for you? Like, how can we move beyond this, um, this concept of just giving the solutions? Mm -hmm. So for me, user-centered has always been involving the user at the very beginning of the process, right? So it's not an afterthought. After years of working, particularly with young people, um, I've seen time and time again where someone will come up with a project or some kind of policy for youth, but it's an afterfact. So once it's already been established, then they'll be like, let's see how young people respond to this, right? And what you get is really tacky, really, uh, you know, that youth font that everybody uses that's like very crazy with neon colors. Um, so you get things that aren't necessarily representative of that demographic. So when we were kind of asked in preparation for this uh, discussion um, to think about the main, thi like the main takeaway that we would do, or we would say, it seemed so obvious that I didn't even want to say it, which is you have to ask, you know, ask the people and communicate with the people that you're, you're working with. So a key part of the way that Wonderland functions is we put together multi-stakeholder groups, and those groups involve the people that we're working with or the community that we're working with to make sure there's representation from the beginning. Because often, sometimes when you give up the solutions without really consulting, it doesn't end up being used by the users. 
I remember in the lobby you gave me a very wonderful example. Was it in India? Yes. There's um, well, I guess one thing that I'd also say is like don't be afraid to be wrong. A lot of people go into different communities or even their own communities, and we carry a lot of cultural baggage with us. So I think it's it's not a bad thing to be working in different environments, but we just need to be aware of what we're carrying and the ability to be like, oh, maybe that won't work. Let me redevelop or let me rethink this idea is key to user experience. Um, the story that I was sharing with Kushbu, did I say your name right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with Kushbu, uh, was about you know a well-intentioned uh, person who goes into rural India and decides that he's observed a community, and one of the main things that a lot of the women are spending time on is washing the laundry. Um, so he's like, oh great, you know, well quick fix, we're going to introduce washing machines. Um, you're smiling because you probably know the story. <laughs> um, but what that observer didn't um, might might have had good intentions, but what they didn't realize was a that the you know washing of clothing is part of a larger social structure which connected the woman and B well it's not necessarily um, efficient and, but anyways the long story short being that the, those washing machines ended up being receptacles for uh, making mango lassies so it's, it's showing how the function <laughs> the function just, just the to know lassi is like a drink with yogurt and water yeah so it became a, a, a tool for an entrepreneurial venture uh, which speaks I think a lot to the point that um, Professor has, has touched upon in terms of the brilliance in, in the... What? But you know, one should be careful in using the word user. Mm -hmm. My father does not use a cell phone. Neither does mine. So, they will, <laughs> so therefore, a cell phone will never be designed for my father because he's not a user. Mm -hmm. You understand the point? They excluded. You know, there are five, six kinds of exclusion. You exclude people over space. You exclude people in the sector. You exclude people over time. You exclude people because of the skills that they have. A tr climbing on the tree is no more necessary, let's say. So then that skill gets excluded. Mm -hmm. Social exclusion on cultural ground and structural exclusion on governance ground. Now, what are we doing here? Aged person wants to have a simple device. He has three sons. He doesn't want to talk to anybody. When he needs somebody, he just presses the button or keeps the phone on the table. The button gets pressed. All three of us know now that father wants us to talk to him. Mm -hmm. We call him and try to understand. Simple device, but he's not a user. So the term user is actually a consumer mm -hmm. oriented term. We should go beyond it. People who have never used cell phone, people who have never used a gadget, people who have never, their needs have never been understood. How will they come into our design process? So I would say people centered, yes. Community-centric design, yes, but user-centric has a little problem because it is user of your product. So mm -hmm. companies designed this language because they wanted their consumers, so to say, to be consulted about next generation of washing machine, next generation of cell phone, what new feature to be added. I don't think that's a very broad definition of how innovations can be triggered in our society. So we should go broader than user and bring in even non-users mm -hmm. into the realm of articulating their need. That's interesting. Um, Anil, you reflected a lot on the informal sector and the innovations that's happening in the informal sector, yet the conditions are not always um, quite, quite good. It's, it's not like a well conditioned for the rest of the projects that happen in a better innovative ecosystem. So how can we design a, more, a better learning system for these, uh, for these informal sector to have more sustainable jobs and be part of the the innovative ecosystem of the city, not just be called as the informal ecosystem. You see, it's very interesting that you ask this question. So I was suggesting to we share that next time, uh, from my experience of talking to the six kids in the morning who came from neighborhood schools in suburban areas, one of the girl mentioned, and you can find it on her statement on my page, Ma Mariana, Mariana. She said, you know, the neighborhoods are called as dangerous neighborhoods. These are called as unsafe neighborhoods. These are called as bad neighborhoods. So nobody wants to engage with us. Nobody wants to come and talk to us. Nobody wants to come and understand what we need or what we have ideas. This labeling must stop. That was her concern. How do we stop labeling whole neighborhood as bad or good? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people there. Some people may be bad, but they are bad or even in the heart of Paris, isn't it? <laughs> bad people don't live only in the suburb. They live in the heart of the city as well. So let us not. So what I'm saying is here's a kid of class ninth, 
articulating her concern about labeling of neighborhoods, which prevents her to show her talent and therefore her creativity and therefore getting feedback from people like you who should tell her what exactly is her, her idea is worth. Today, after five o'clock, this place has been opened so that people can come from neighborhood. That mm -hmm. kind of openness is the step one in creating a very conducive ecosystem. Open spaces where anybody can come, no need for permission, no need for tickets. They can come and talk and share their ideas, get feedback. Second thing is, you know, we have a venture capitalist will give you a million euros. You want 500 euros or 1,000 euros to do test marketing of your idea? You won't get it. So when I asked Armando, how much cost will it be for making these pockets for holding your hand? He said, about five euros. So I said, can you do, make 50 pieces? I'll give you 250 euros. 250 pieces to test with 50 users. Where is the ecosystem provision for giving 250 or 500 or 1,000 euros to these kids to test their ideas in the market? Mm -hmm. So we need to provide not just microfinance. Microfinance is for goods and services for which market exists. Micro venture finance, micro venture innovation finance is for goods and services for which market does not yet exist because there is no product as yet. We need to provide risk capital at small scale. Very important. Not just for market testing, but also for product development. Early stage financing. Early stage financing when you are not even sure that the product will come out or the proof of concept will work. Today, financing for early stage doesn't exist. That too, at a small scale, doesn't exist. Informal sector, we designed this micro venture innovation fund of a million dollar. All over the country, we funded. You can go to nifindia.org slash mvif, micro venture innovation fund. You will find all the 200 investments we made. 80% money came back. Single signature, no guarantee, no obligant, no legal document. In other words, trust-based investment in ideas of people so that they can take risk, try things out. If they fail, we have all learned. If they <laughs> succeed, well, good. We need to create several building blocks. Yeah, that's time. definitely one of the good point to create open spaces that could bridge these two worlds. Sonia, what is, in your opinion, you think the barriers that we need to overcome to bridge these two informal and formal ecosystems? The innovation that's happening in the informal, how can they bring it in the heart of the city with the other innovators and entrepreneurs? Mm -hmm. When I was thinking about that earlier, I think it's interesting because the trajectory changes. So when you have informal innovation or grassroots innovation, it's, it's in that kind of gray area. And then once you shift towards um, more process, more red tape, more definitions, more terminology, then th the players in the informal sector have a really difficult time existing in the more formalized uh, innovation. I think to the point that we were discussing a little bit earlier is that innovation exists, some of the best innov innovations exist out of necessity or are discovered out of necessity and they thrive in those types of environments. Um, so it seems that now innovation has gone to another way that is largely tech dominated or largely um, dominated even using uh, language that is not inclusive. Um, I think I really enjoyed the format before where speakers had questions for the audience uh, and I would like to do the same if the speakers who want to go first would like to give, uh, have a question for our audience. So how many of you <laughs> have solved a problem in your neighborhood, in your house, in your community in a manner that nobody had done it before? Yeah? Why not you share? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I don't know in my neighborhood. I'm from Medellin, Colombia. Uh, probably, as you know, in 1991, Medellin was the, the, the most dangerous city in the world. And I was involved in the last 15 years in all the entrepreneurship and innovation policy and agenda for the city. And actually, in 2013, we won, a pri we won a prize as the most innovative city in the world. So at the end, you know, coming back from the ashes. And I was involved in, a, in some sense in, in that evolution. Wonderful, wonderful. Identifying ideas and nurturing them, and that made your city so great. Anyone else? Here.
Hi, everybody. Thank you. So um, I live in, uh, in Italy, but in winter, uh, since four years, I'm developing a project in Jamaica to create uh, sustainability and research and social innovation. And uh, I started the first the project by renovating an a, a old building to transform it into a guest house, which is not a guest house, it's a cultural center, in which uh, I asked the fishermen, for example, to um, not give back to the sea the lionfish, which is invading the shores, but to, to bring it to me. So I will buy it for half of the price in the market of the lobster and cook it for them and invite them into the guest house so they can see that the, lob the, the fish is not poisoner when it's dead. It's poisoning only when it's alive. But they would never eat it. So I had, and they take the fish from the lobster and from the trap and they put it back. And then they complain after that there is only this lionfish eating everything. <laughs> so we started to um, teach the community that uh, feel uh, it's good, especially with spaghetti. <laughs> Plus, uh, another social issue in the village in which I'm developing my project in which everybody is uh, invited to help because I want the social innovator, innovators from every place to go there, is that young girls, they are not supposed to go to the beach. No, no, no. Uh, you look like a bad girl if you go to the beach. Only in that, in that place there is only the beach. Uh, the girls only can go to church. I'm talking about Jamaica. Eh? <laughs> Guys go to the beach because there is this sex tourism of ladies. <laughs> so if you are a guy, you can go to the beach. If you are a girl, you cannot go to the beach. So what I invented, okay, all the tourists are complaining that there are no sunbeds in the beach. So I invited all the girls in the community and we built sunbeds on the beach. So they had an excuse to make some money renting out the sunbeds while building them together on the beach. Men look like that, like what? White lady working? Young girls in the community, in the beach, yes, we are making some bets for social innovation and to allow <laughs> tourists to give us a little money. So, it's what <laughs> Wonderful. That's, that's really, really good. Sonia, right. do you have a question for our audience? Mm, one of the topics that keeps coming up over and over again through the last few days, obviously, is this core value of collaboration. So I'm curious if anybody wants to share um, a time when they wanted to collaborate and it was difficult. So kind of like the, a failure to attempted collaboration or what are some of the barriers to true collaboration? Hi. Um, this is slightly abstract. Um, so I work for a collective impact campaign in the UK that is the first of its kind and it's at present it's been going for about three years and it's a collection of about 700 organizations, businesses uh, and individuals but, but mainly organizations and businesses that cross sectors and basically everyone is working together to try and get more young people involved in volunteering and social action. Um, it's called the I Will campaign uh, and there are other examples of similar models uh, internationally but it's been a really challenging experience trying to get the public sector, the private sector, the voluntary sector to all kind of come together um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's been a really great experience, but we, we finish in 2020, and I don't know whether we'll reach our target, but we aim to get 60% of uh, 10 to 20 year olds in the UK involved in community projects. What's the biggest challenge you faced in that collaboration? I think it is just, it's just getting people to work together who come from such different backgrounds and trying to get people, um, everyone's got their own kind of vested interest and it's good to have a, a cause that is quite, um, you know, you can't really disagree with it in some way, so, so that helps. Um, but actually just trying to deal with such a complex picture of s such a large scale, you know, across the UK there are so many different kind of levers at, at play that... Um, actually achieving anything and seeing an, a direct impact of what we're doing is quite challenging. Um, but, you know, yeah. Sometimes it may be useful to remember that at different stages of an idea evolution, you can have individual creativity, then you can have collaboration for implementing it. Then you can have individual strategy to take it forward, and then you can have collaboration. So it need not be that at each stage of the value chain, we need to have collaboration. That's one of the mistakes that we make sometimes. And we realize why our spaces are not being used. We have created this wonderful facility and community is not using it because we are not giving a space for diversity of individual versus collective. 
So we must do that. That's a mistake that many times we do. Second thing we should also remember is that the people, when they are conceiving an idea, they need some isolation. So too much of collaboration at every stage will kill the entrepreneurial spirit. So please provide spaces for isolation and collaboration. Both of them in a manner that they don't interfere or impinge on each other's freedom and autonomy. Then probably these spaces will work better. The collaboration will take place more easily. Okay. Um, there's one more experience. Maybe then we can take a few questions from the audience for our speakers before we end. The, it's the last session of the day. Um, yes, so in terms of problems that I faced uh, with collaboration, I work uh, freelance as a management consultant. And so often I'm working with different organizations um, who will engage in a, um, like a brainstorming session. And so like each different, like say for example Airbus, they have their different departments. So they have the engineers for the wings and for the body, things like that. And so they're coming in, each uh, different department is coming in and they're doing these brainstorming sessions. But then there's always some sort of blocking point when... Um, somebody has already come in and worked on a project, but the information that they have come up with or the solutions that they have come up with are not being shared with other people who are coming in after. Mm -hmm. So everybody is starting from point A when they could be starting from M, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and to help move the project further along. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a question of, I don't know if it's ego, people want to take uh, credit for a certain project or solutions. Um, or if it's just bureaucracy or just the way that things are handled because there is some level of confidentiality even though they're working in the same companies and so that has always been, it's always been a bit difficult business side but more difficult on the human side. So actually maybe I can throw the question back to you guys, how do you manage uh, difficulty with collaborations on the human side? Can you expand what you mean on the human side? For you go? Okay. I mean, uh, yeah, <laughs> go ahead. No, you go. Well, I would say that giving credit more generously and more graciously always creates the space for collaboration to take place. The sense that I have done it, it is my creation in policy research, in institutional development, everywhere. This is the pillar of a collaboration. I mean, too much of identity of the individuals with an idea kills the idea. What is important? The fact that you have created it, or the fact that idea is important. If idea is important, low-key, subterranean consciousness, so that we don't become too closely identified. A lot of policy changes that we could bring about, we created a fund for every district to have one crore, 250,000 euros, for every district, 700 districts in our country. Nobody knows that I was the one who wrote the background paper for that, for the 13 Finance Commission. I know, and the Finance Commission chairman knows. But the rest of the country didn't know. And doesn't that need to know? It's mm -hmm. not important for them to know. What is important is, first time in our history, in our country, there was a fund available to, at a district level for innovation to be financed. So probably it is a good lesson from what you're describing, even in the corporations, for people not to identify too closely with the thing that they have set into motion, lest other people adopt it. See, everybody wants to take care of their children. I yeah. don't want to adopt others' children. <laughs> <laughs> Tanya, do you have any reflection on that topic? I mean, not at this point. Okay. Is there <laughs> I don't want to beat it. I would r rather have more questions. Sure. Uh, any other question from the audience? Come on, it's the last session of the day. Uh, we discussed that a bit earlier with the woman who just asked the last question, which was very interesting. But we were thinking about the term grassroots, so we spoke a lot about all the different terms that we are talking about during this fest and constantly. And I wanted to know, what, how would you define grassroots? And aren't we all the grassroots of someone else at some point? <laughs> Good question. You see, for us, in the Honeybee Network, the definition was unaided, self-triggered and self-designed solution by people who have not received any professional training or professional support. That was the way we defined grassroots. So people in the informal sector who have solved a problem through their own genius without any outside help and without any professional training were grassroots. 
Now, when we talk about grassroots innovation, we should distinguish innovation at grassroots, innovation with grassroots, innovation from grassroots, and innovation for, for grassroots. All the four are very different things. A large company can design a solution that grassroots people find very useful, and that is innovation for grassroots. Or the walker that we talked about, children in the school can come out with an idea, unaided, without any professional training, that a walker must have adjustable leg. That's an innovation from grassroots. Innovation can be jointly, we can work with the community and jointly solve a problem. That is innovation with grassroots. And if I only have my experiment at the grassroots level, but I'm not involved in the community at all, for example, if this festival was not open to the neighborhood community today, it will be a festival in the suburb, but not with the suburb. It will be at <laughs> this place, but it will not be for or with this space. So that kind of openness can be possible. So grassroots, it's better that we don't confuse this term and don't dilute this term too much, because then it reduces the focus on the people we want to bring into attention. People who work with their hands, who live by their hands, and who generally don't have maybe more than three, four, five workers at a time. So those self-employed people are basically the glass of people that we're talking about. But before you close, I want to make an appeal, if you sure. permit me. Go for it. Because this is such a great festival. I have learned so much. I've met such wonderful children, such wonderful people here. But I think the space for collaboration, that question has come up repeatedly, must also be a space where people will volunteer for time, for mentoring these creative ideas in schools, in colleges. My friend Serge is from a technical university. When we created Techpedia, what did we want? We wanted that small sector which generates most jobs. Today, the industrial growth is becoming jobless. In our country, we had 8% growth, hardly 1.5% jobs, growth in jobs. No jobs are being created by the large sector. So where will the jobs come from? They will come from small sector. If a small sector has to generate job, it must become competitive and innovative. It doesn't have resources to do its own R&D. So I think all of us sitting here and the students of the technology institutions must do R&D that is required to make small sector more efficient and more competitive and more buoyant. Because if small sector doesn't grow, then jobs are not there. If jobs are not mm -hmm. there, you will have alienation, unrest, violence. So in the interest of sharing, I'm requesting and appealing to all of us that let us decide, let us understand economic crisis. A transition is taking place in the fifth industrial revolution where jobs will not be generated despite industrial growth. And these will come only from small enterprises. How to make small enterprises more creative and dynamic? Either they do R&D or we do R&D for them. So please find some time in your portfolio for small sector or informal sector. Thank you. Okay. Well, yeah, do you want to give us a last reflections, wrap up the, this interesting discussion? <laughs> um, I would just open it up that if anybody wants that has any questions that they can approach after, afterwards. Sure. That's probably the, maybe the last question because we are running out of time. I, I actually shook my head uh, when you said if I'd done anything uh, to change my neighborhood. No. I, we're in the process of um, where I live, it's not, it's not going to become mine. Um, and I think we might have changed this. This is a long story, so I won't tell you. But this is something that I, I've just been there and things have happened. So this is, um, I, I'm, I'm almost 50 years old. So this is a new way of things happening around you without um, anyone actually organizing it. So the question from the society has always been, who's the organizer? And I was like, I'm not, and no <laughs> one is. Uh, but we've made changes. Uh, I actually work as a civil servant, so I know that what we've done has uh, in, uh, changed the minds of our, my colleagues. But I haven't said anything at work that I'm in this process. <laughs> um, but I, um, that this, um, the question here is that, that this is something that's going to change the whole society if it's going to be a mine. So this is the picture you had on the cat who was lazy uh, and, and, you know, wealth doesn't change. So, so I understand that this, um, this um, 
when it's, 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 it's such a big change in, in society. People, people do actually do move and do something. But in my work as a civil servant, I think it's difficult to get people interested when it is changes that we, you know, we want to change uh, uh, the questions of digitalization of the society. I also work with rural, rural areas for them to survive, but they're actually kind of happy anyway, but we see a change coming. How do I, how do I get the grassroots interested when, it's, when they're a bit lazy? <laughs> well, there are always few things. <laughs> there are always oh. few things in which people are excited. Begin with things that people are good at and not people are bad at. One fundamental principle I learned over the last 30 years in Honeybee Network is Focus on what people are good at and make that as the starting point of dialogue. If we complain about what they don't do, they're not interested in listening to us. But if you talk about, look, you are famous. The fish the example that you gave is a beautiful example. Now, that fish is poisonous so long as it's alive, you said. But when you have caught it off and then you cook it, nice. People who are interested in cooking would like to talk about this. It's a great idea. We must change our practice, and I'm sure it must have changed by now to a large extent, because it was something to do with what they did and did well. They must have been doing a lot of recipes, formulations of fish, but somehow this was not there. It was a small change, but a very significant change, because this is available more easily, affordable, than the lobsters, which are costlier mm -hmm. and not available as much. So this kind of change has to bring about, she gave an example, I liked it, that if you begin with what we are good at, then plugging in a new bit of change is easier. But if you begin with something that I'm not interested in at all, you can keep on <laughs> saying that cat will not move. <laughs> <laughs> okay. no. yeah, oh, there you go. Ah, yeah, it's working. Uh, I would just like to thank you, both of you, for being very inspiring and sharing so many concrete ideas, as well as thank you to the audience for being so interactive and wonderful and having patience to be there for the last session of the day. So thank you, everybody. And I want to take this opportunity yeah. to present my book. I, do you have a pen? Yes. So I will give it to the We Share Festival. with my love and affection. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.